Well, welcome to Curtis Lake, everybody. Uh, my name is Ryan Hall. I'm the lead pastor here. If you're our guest today, thank you so very much for coming. If you invited someone and brought them today, I apologize. Because given the first two services, the message is a snoozer. So uh, just grab a pillow and you'll enjoy it much better. Now, we're glad you're here today to celebrate the, uh, the fact that Jesus is alive. And that changes everything. It was quite a surprise for the disciples, I'm sure, as uh, they thought it was over with and Jesus was alive. How many of you have ever been surprised at some point in your life? Raise your hand up nice and high, a little group participation. You've been surprised. How many of you, raise your hand, you've been surprised by something and you weren't too happy about it? You weren't surprised. I remember after we had had our son, Judah, I say we, I really had nothing to do with the having part. I was more involved in the creation, but Judah was born, and, uh, and after he had been born, you know, I think my wife's agenda was to wait a little while, have a baby, another baby, and uh, I guess my agenda was different, and uh, we ended up uh, getting pregnant. Again, we, I really wasn't ever pregnant, never have been pregnant. My wife was pregnant, and uh, she became pregnant very soon after, so our kids are, uh, I don't even know how many months apart they are. Uh, they're like seven months, so it was weird. No, they're <laughs> no, just kidding. Just kidding. They're, so, they're, so they're really close together. But that was a surprise. Like, I don't think I'll ever remember or I'll ever forget the look on, like, my wife's face when she came out and told me. She's like, I'm pregnant. Like, it was not, like, happy. And it wasn't sad. It was more anger directed at me. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I was like, what did I have to do with this? Then she explained it to me. I was like, oh. <laughs> that's, yeah, I have to take ownership for that surprise. Sorry about that. But uh, we do. We have these surprises in life. We don't know what to do with them. And some are good surprises, and the timing is off a little bit. Some of them are surprises that we're not happy with. The other day, I was driving on Main Street, dropped the kids off at school, came back home, and I was near uh, the Burger King there. You know where Burger King is? Right, yeah, you know where Burger King is. Don't act like you don't know where Burger King is. <laughs> you guys like, chicken fries are back. You're all over it. I know. So, uh, so I'm, I'm, part, I'm, I'm stopped there at that stoplight by Burger King and Martin's, and I hear that noise of, like, metal crushing metal, you know, like no screech of tires, just boom, you know, real quick. And I look in the rearview mirror and believe it or not, like the car behind me had just been rear-ended by the car behind it, you know, and you have that feeling like this just ruined my day, <laughs> right? I mean, because you weren't expecting it. You had your day planned, going to work, and then all of a sudden, Wham, it just changes everything. And in those moments, we have those accidents in life. We have those car crashes that just change everything. Like that person behind me, I just immediately started thinking, oh, what would I have done if that car would have backed into me today? Like I just started going through all the stuff I had to do in the day and how that would have changed everything. And then you got to call insurance companies and get, oh, it just, it changes everything in our lives. It can be really frustrating. And when those surprises happen, when either we are the recipient of the car accidents, so to speak, or we are the ones who cause the car accidents, one of the first things that we have a tendency to do is to get advice, right? We call people, right? If your car gets in an accident, you're calling people, finding out, hey, where should I take my car? I need to get an estimate, and who's going to give me a really high estimate so I can get more money from the insurance company? You know, I know you're asking that question. You know, where should I go? Where's a place that's not going to take advantage of me? You're trying to figure out, hey, should I sue them? Right? I mean, you ask all these questions, we go get advice. And we get advice about all kinds of things in life. We get relationship advice. We turn to people for advice. Sometimes we go and get advice from the wrong people. You ever done that before? Right? You know, one of the, what, what's so fascinating is like these uh, magazines that you see on the newsstands as you're in, you know, line at Shaw's or Hannaford's or Walmart or wherever you go shopping or Market Basket. I want to get all of them. I don't want to offend anybody. Uh, you know, or you go to Jerry's Market, wherever. They've got like the magazines and they have all kinds of information and advice from celebrities about relationships. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Statistically speaking, celebrities are twice as likely for their relationships to end in disaster. That's just the truth, statistics. I'm not making that up. But we still love to get dating advice from celebrities. So how many of you know who Adam Levine is? Raise your hand up nice and high. There was a lot more excitement about Adam Levine than Jesus Christ during worship today. I'm just saying. So Adam Levine, the lead singer of Maroon 5, he's on The Voice, uh, one of the voice coaches. Uh, he gave some advice about dating. He said on his first dates, what he likes to do is test the heart of the person 
who he's dating. He just wants to put them to a test, make sure their heart is in the right place. So they get all fancy, and he puts on a tuxedo, and then he takes them to McDonald's. That's exactly right. Takes them to McDonald's. Like, what is that all? That seems like really, really bad advice. Like, who told him that? I just have a feeling that's not a good way to start a relationship, you know? Or uh, how many of you have heard of Uma Thurman? Anybody heard of Uma Thurman? Anybody heard of Uma Thurman? No? No. So the guys are like, they'll make fun of me. I'm not saying anything, <laughs> right? Well, Uma Thurman, she recently uh, did an interview uh, with a, a magazine in Britain. And in Britain, uh, she told them, you know, it's getting harder and harder as a mature woman to find a mature man. It's getting more and more difficult uh, to, to do that. And, and, and so, you know, it's just you got to be patient. But she says, you know, it's better to date somebody who will cheat on you than a man who won't put the toilet seat down. Like, that seems like really, really bad relationship advice to me. Right? I mean, I don't have a doctorate. I'm not a psychologist. I'm certainly not a therapist, a marriage counselor, but like that seems a bit off, right? But we do, we want to get advice for the tough questions in life. We want to get advice for those moments where we just, we feel like it's just a little outside our expertise. Should I change jobs? Should I leave this relationship? Should I file for divorce? Should we move in together? Does he really love me? Does she really love me? Should I, you know, go and confront my boss about the, the circumstances at work and how I feel? Should I confront my spouse about something that is bothering me? Should I tell my spouse about something that I did? We all have these tough questions, and we go and we seek advice from people. And it's interesting, many of us have been given advice, and many of us have given the very same advice. It's very, very popular advice. In fact, it's so popular that the band Lady Antebellum wrote a song about it called Compass. So listen to this song and see if you can hear the most common advice that is given in difficult situations. So uh, what was the advice? Follow your... <laughs> that is the worst advice you could ever give somebody. That is the worst advice you could ever follow. Follow your heart. And the, pro the song promises you will never be alone. Let me tell you what, you're alone when you can't afford the car payment because you followed your heart that told you you deserve it. You followed your heart. Oh, he loves me. He'll never leave me. He'll never do anything. And you will end up alone following your heart into places that your heart tells you to go. I mean, it is foolishness to think that your heart can guide you. Think about in your own life. We could just, we could have testimony time, like old school church. Have you stand up like, tell me a time where you followed your heart and it went down a path that you wish you never would have done. Like, it is, it is the most ridiculous idea to say, well, I'll just follow my heart and everything will work out in the end. Because our heart, the Bible says, is a problematic thing. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says this, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things. Not just a, pro a little deceitful, the most deceitful of all things and is desperately wicked. Yeah, that's you. Just follow that. Follow your heart. Go for it. It sounds good. It sounds wonderful. It makes for great poetry and songs and little graphics that we display and even tattoos. But it's terrible advice. And then this question comes, who really knows how bad it is? What that's saying is when you kind of have a grasp at how bad your heart is, you really don't even have a clue at how bad your heart is. It's that bad. Right? It's that bad. Just, you know what? Just eat the apple, Eve. It's no problem. Hey, Adam, come here. Just follow your heart, Adam. You love me, right? Just come. right? Our heart gets us into trouble. When we follow our heart, we go down roads and we go down paths that often make life more difficult. Because you see, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. Because the heart, in and of itself, is most concerned with itself. Self-preservation. What makes me happy? What makes me wealthy? What makes me feel good? And that's where your heart will direct you. That's where your heart will guide you. And so here's what happens. We're faced with a difficult decision. We sit down with some well-meaning person who says, you know what, just follow your heart. Okay, follow my heart. I'm going to follow my heart right into that relationship. Move in together. I'm going to follow my heart right into that workplace that I really don't think about it, but it's just more money. I don't worry about it. I'm just going to follow my heart. And then what happens is we get hurt. 
we followed our heart, we end up hurt, and then we start asking questions like, why me? We start asking questions like, what did I do to deserve this? And in the worst case scenarios, you end up in a situation that's abusive, and your heart starts to tell you, well, you know what, you kind of deserve it. You made the decision, you know, you followed your heart. You stayed, you could have left, you deserve it, you're worthless. And your heart begins to lie to you, and you get in this cycle, and you listen to your heart. But here's the amazing thing. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, there is a way to get a heart that you can actually follow. There's a way to transform our hearts into something that isn't so deceitful and so wicked, but we can actually follow it. So that's what I want to do today. I want to answer this question. How can we get a heart that we can trust? How can we get a heart that truly can be a compass to guide us? And then I want to answer the question that many of you are asking right now. What is up with improv? Like, what does that have to do with God, the Bible, church, anything? And so I'm going to answer that question. And then, just because you came today, and at least 20% of you dressed up, I'm going to tell you something that nobody else is going to tell you in this world. I'm going to tell you the one thing that God can do for you that nothing else can. Just for coming today. Free with the price of admission. I'm going to tell you the one thing that the world cannot do, the world cannot promise. There's no book out there. There's no relationship out there. There is something that only God can offer you that changes everything. And you cannot find it any place else. And I'm going to tell you that when we get to the end here. But let's go to that question of the heart. To figure out what, our, what has to happen in our hearts, I want to look at a story about some people who experienced the resurrected Jesus. And so the Bible says that there were these two men, and they were traveling on this road to a town called Emmaus. Now, Emmaus was seven miles from Jerusalem. They had been in Jerusalem during, Passion, during the, the Holy Week because of Passover. They had witnessed the crucifixion of Jesus. And so they're traveling back on this road to Emmaus, talking about it. And the Bible says that Jesus suddenly began to walk with them. I don't know if like, it just looked like he was hiding behind some tree, and he was like, hey, and he just started walking right? But they're on this road, and the Bible says that God kind of closed these men's eyes so that they couldn't recognize that it was Jesus walking with them. And so here's what happens. They're walking on the road. Jesus says to them this in Luke chapter 24. What are you discussing so intently as you walk along? Jesus says, hey, what's up? Like, you, you guys are like into a deep conversation. What's that all about? And the Bible says that they stopped short with sadness written across their faces. You ever had that moment where somebody finally asks you, hey, what's wrong? And it just, it just, you stop, and it just all comes out. And see, the reality is on their faces was written what was going on in their hearts, right? Their faces told the story of their hearts, and it's true for you, and it's true for me. When we go through life and we have those surprises, those circumstances that don't turn out the way we want them to, our faces tell the story of our hearts. See, these men thought that the story was going to be different with Jesus, they thought that this was going to be the Messiah, the king, the person to remove all of what is wrong with Israel, and he died. And so as they traveled along the way, they began to talk more about it. And, and there was one of them named Cleopas, great name for a firstborn, great name. As they're walking, this is what he says to Jesus, right, probably sarcastically, I love it. You must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. And he goes on to tell Jesus what happened to him. <laughs> like, I just wonder what was going on in Jesus' mind at that point. Oh, really? He was crucified? Oh, I bet that hurt. <laughs> like, I just, I, I would just, I just, I just wish that, I just hope that Jesus messed with them a little bit. You know, walking down there, you're talking to him, asking questions. And, and all oh, the disciples, everything that happened, right? And they, they say to them, he, they say to Jesus, but listen, Jesus, like we talked to the disciples. And the disciples said that some women went to the tomb and it was empty. And like I just pictured Jesus going, what? It was empty. And they, it was empty. And the disciples went themselves and they said it was empty. But we don't know. And the Bible says that Jesus then said to them this, you foolish people. Remember, they just met this guy. <laughs> like, you foolish people. In today's terms, you morons. Like, how, 
Are you serious? Is it so hard for you to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures? And Jesus begins to say, listen, you, your heart is at issue here. Why is it so difficult for you to believe what was prophesied, what said would happen? Because the truth is their hearts told them it was impossible. They had heard the eyewitness accounts. They had talked to the disciples. They knew that the tomb was empty, but their hearts still told them it was impossible, and they couldn't believe it. And so Jesus goes on, and he says, wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? And then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses, the first part of the Old Testament, and then he took them through the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So as they're walking seven miles, Jesus gives them this incredibly long sermon. <laughs> and they're just captivated by him, much like you are right now. Just totally into it, taking notes, thinking this is the best thing that ever happened to me besides my wedding day. And they're listening intently, and they finally, it, it goes by so fast, they're now arriving and they're coming into the town of Emmaus. It says, by the time they were nearing Emmaus, it was the end of their journey, and Jesus acted as if he was going on. You know, that person who's like, no, you pay for it. <laughs> no, you take the bill. No, you take it. Like, Jesus is like, well, I really have to go. No, stay. No, I really need to go. And he's acting like he has someplace else to go. But they convinced him, just stay with us tonight. It's, it's getting late. And so the Bible says that Jesus went home with them. Jesus went home with them. And as they sat down to eat, he took the bread, and he blessed it, and then he broke it, and he gave it to them. And suddenly, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. Wow, that is a bad weekend. <laughs> like, that is awful. Like, why would Jesus do that to you? But here's what I think happened. He's like, well, they get it. I'm done. Right? They couldn't see. They didn't believe. And in that moment, their eyes were open, and they saw it happening. And they saw Jesus before them, and it hit them. It really happened. And Jesus is like, all right, see you later, bye. I don't even think he said anything. He's just, poof, gone. And so they sit there, right? Like, what do you say? Who breaks the silence? Like, I, that is an awkward moment right there, I'm sure. And the Bible says that they actually said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us? Didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? There was something about Jesus that gave them heartburn. That's what it says. Because Jesus was speaking contrary to what their hearts were telling them. Their hearts were saying, you can't believe it, it's impossible. But their hearts were burning inside of them because it was contrary to what their sinful nature wanted them to believe. Their nature that was possessed and, and by this world and captivated by only what they could see with their own eyes. And immediately, this is what they do. This is great. And within the hour, they were back on their way to Jerusalem. They did not take the bus. They just walked seven miles. This happens. They're like, we got to go back. We got to go find the disciples. We got to go tell them what just happened. So they pack up their stuff. At night now, mind you, they take this road back to Jerusalem. They get into Jerusalem. They find the disciples there. And they're like, you weren't lying. <laughs> The disciples were like, of course we're not lying. We're Christians, you know. They probably didn't use that word just yet, but it was, you know, something like that. And so they begin to tell the disciples, this is what happened. We're on the road, and we didn't recognize him. Then he comes, and he breaks the bread, and poof, he's gone. And the Bible says, just as they were telling this story to him, Jesus himself suddenly appeared standing right there in front of them, and he said, peace be with you. Now, if I'm the two guys in Emmaus, I am ticked off at Jesus because I just walked seven miles and you could have just poof got me here. <laughs> like I'm thinking to myself, why can't I just grab onto your robe? Can we just teleport together next time? Seems like a cruel joke to make me walk another seven miles when you can just get here. But Jesus shows up in the middle of them again, right? And, and it's all, the whole group, the Bible says, is just freaking out. They're startled and frightened and they're thinking, we're seeing a ghost. Like their heart is telling them it's still not true. Like he's right in front of them, but the heart is saying, this is a ghost. We, had, we must have eaten something. It was like the beginning of a Christmas carol. You're a bit of bad beef, Jesus. And they, they, they're, they're, they're so distressed. He's standing in front of them. The Bible says their hearts were filled with doubt because Jesus had to say to them, why are you frightened? Why are your hearts 
filled with doubt. And so Jesus says to them, look at my hands and look at my feet. Touch them. You can see that it's really me. Make sure that I'm not a ghost standing before you because ghosts don't have bodies as the one that I do. And then Jesus opened their minds to the scriptures. For a few verses in there, he begins to just explain everything again. This is what's supposed to happen. And he opens their minds to the scriptures. And what had to happen was Jesus had to open the eyes of their heart, their minds to understanding that this is what God said would happen. This is what needed to happen so that you could have life. And he explains, and their eyes are opened up. And he finishes with this. He says, listen, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. But he says, but it was also written, this message. It was written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name, of Jesus' name, to all the nations, the entire world, beginning right in Jerusalem. And this is the message, and this is what it was all about, forgiveness. This is the message, that there is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. Forgiveness of sins for all who repent. This is what it was all about. Jesus says the whole point was you can be forgiven. What does that word forgiven mean? That word forgiven means not guilty. We don't have an understanding of forgiveness because we really can't comprehend it. It is as if to say you never did anything wrong. It's not that you did something wrong. It's not that we recognize you did something wrong and you did your time or you paid the penalty, you paid your parking ticket. It's as if it never happened forgiven. And the only way that that happens was because Jesus was the penalty for our sins. That Jesus actually didn't just take the penalty of our sins, but he took our sins upon himself as if he committed them. So now, for people who repent, you stand before God perfect, never having done anything wrong. That is amazing. See, it's not just a matter of, well, I did something wrong, I paid my time. It's as if you never did it. And that is what allows us to come before God because God is perfect, holy, righteous. And anything imperfect, unholy, and unrighteous cannot exist in his presence. It will be consumed. But because of the work of Christ, we can stand before God forgiven as if we have never sinned. But we have to repent. Jesus says forgiveness is available to those who repent. So what is repentance? Well, repentance is simply owning our mistakes before God. How many of you have kids? Raise your hand nice and high. You got kids, right? How many of you, your kids, don't own their mistakes all the time? (laughs) Right? Like, did you eat this candy bar? What candy bar? The candy bar that half of it is still on your face. No, 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 no. The candy bar that I found the wrapper under your bed, I don't know how that got there. No idea what you're talking about. Did you hit your brother? No. I don't even know if I have a brother. I did not hit my brother. My brother fell into my fist. I was simply going to scratch my head, and at that same time, my brother tripped, and he fell into my knuckles. That's what happened. Right? Kids are prone to not take ownership of their mistakes because they're afraid. But the resurrection and the cross of Jesus Christ says we don't have to be afraid to take ownership of our mistakes because forgiveness is available. And so we come before God humbly and we say, I am a sinner. I'm a sinner. I make mistakes. I will always make mistakes. And the only way that I can stand before God and the only way that I can have the life that God has for me, the only way that I can have a relationship with him, the only way that I can spend eternity with God who is perfect is to recognize that it's because of Christ. It's because Jesus came and conquered death, hell, and the grave. And I can be forgiven. And I can stand before God righteous, perfect. It's that that is so powerful. And so after Jesus says the message, this is what he says. And now I will send the Holy Spirit, just as my Father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. The gift of repentance, according to Jesus, when you and I repent, the gift is the Holy Spirit. And it just got weird in here. Everybody's like, oh, great. 
You're going to have me handle snakes now. We're all going to be dancing up and down and shouting things out, falling over. I'm out of here. No, that's not the point. And the Holy Spirit is not something that comes and possesses you like a devil. You know, it's not going to happen, all right? That's not how it works. You are spirit. You know that, right? You have a soul. You are a spiritual thing that is in, enveloped by this tent of a body the Bible talks about. And when you and I repent, when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he has made a way of forgiveness, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is given to us and lives inside of us and does what the law couldn't do, empowers us, moves us forward. Paul says it this way in his letter to the Romans, in Romans chapter 8. He says, so God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies you and I have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirements of the law would be fulfilled and satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. See, here's the issue. Following your heart, that's following your sinful nature. That's what it means, right? You follow your sinful nature, which is about me, which is about what feels good to me, which is what makes sense to me. But God says, no, no, no. When you come and repent, when you receive the work of Christ, you're filled with his spirit, and now you follow his spirit, which lives inside of you, and that you can trust. So what's the point of the Holy Spirit, this third person of God, the Trinity, this idea of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit is active in our world. He's active in the lives of believers. And the point of the Holy Spirit, Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, says this, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. Now, I tricked you earlier. Remember when I asked you how many of you ever asked for advice? You raised your hand, and some of you didn't, but you're liars. That's okay. Why do you ask for advice? Because you're weak. Because you can't do it on your own. Because sometimes you don't know which way to go. Sometimes life gets too hard. Sometimes the road is too bumpy, like that song says. And so what do we do? In our weakness, we look for help. But sometimes we don't know where to go for help. And the role of the Holy Spirit is to empower believers, people who believe in Jesus, to follow him, to help those believers know which way to turn, where to go, what am I doing? How do I deal with this situation? We're guided by the living God who is inside of us, the Holy Spirit. And so Romans 8, it goes on, and he says, listen, the Holy Spirit prays for us. See, there are times, for example, when you don't know how to pray, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that, you know what, we can't express in words. We just don't know. But the Holy Spirit inside of us is praying for us on our behalf. And the Father who knows all, what's the word there? hearts. He knows all hearts, knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. I love it. Knows all hearts. Why? Our heart is now consumed by God, consumed by the Holy Spirit when we repent and we believe. The resurrection that allows forgiveness. And so being consumed by the Holy Spirit, God hears that prayer. And then here's, here's where it all comes down to. This is the part. Lean in with me. Just lean in. Because this is really good. You don't want to miss this. This is our anchor verse. This is the whole point of the series. series. Romans 8, 28 says this. And we know that God causes, what's the word? Everything. Come on, it's Easter. God causes everything to work together for the good of anybody. Nope. Of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. In other words, God can work out for our good everything that happens to us if we love him and we follow his spirit. And that's where the improv comes in because the Holy Spirit is the greatest improv partner for life. Because the Holy Spirit will take any knucklehead decision you make, and if you will allow the Holy Spirit to, he will use it for your benefit. And the Holy Spirit can take any knucklehead decision that somebody else makes that harms you. And if you will allow and you will follow the Spirit and not your own heart, God will use it for His glory, for your benefit, for your good. 
You know what improv is, right? Everybody say, if you've ever heard, watched an improv sketch, raise your hand up nice and high, right? So improv, you get actors on a stage, they don't know what's going on, and they have to improvise. They have to make it up. So rather than me try to explain it to you, we thought we'd show it to you today. How many of you like to see a little improv this morning at Curtis Lake Church? So give our improv actors a great big hand as they come out. <laughs> Jeff Farrell, improv actor number one. Mr. Brett Williams, improv actor number two, and the Reverend Josh Parison. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a little improv called the superhero improvisation. Here's how this works. Mr. Brett is going to start off as a superhero, and there's going to be a crisis in the world, and then our other actors are going to enter into the scene and try and help out. Okay, so what I need, first of all, from the crowd is the name of an unlikely superhero. The name of an unlikely superhero. Underwear man, I like that. Underwear man. <laughs> How about too tight underwear man? That'd be even better. <laughs> Captain too tight underwear man. And now what I need is a world crisis, a world crisis that needs to be solved, an unlikely crisis. What was that, a diaper shortage? A diaper shortage. There is a diaper shortage in the world. Captain too tight of underpants. And uh, what's going to happen... Brett will start the scene, and then our other actors will enter in, and they will be told who their superhero is. They don't know who that superhero is, and they will have to step into the scene and act. Now, I have it here, so I'm going to give this to you. You're going to tell Mr. Farrell here what this is. No, I'm going to give this to you. I don't know what I'm doing here. And this this I'm going to give to you. Okay, Okay. wonderful. And uh, so you're going to enter, and then you're going to tell each other, and this is how it's going to work. Let's see if it's not an utter disaster. Captain, too tight underpants, saving the world from a shortage of diapers. That's the scene. Action. I love Easter. This is the best. There's nothing like just feeling the support of good friends on Easter. Oh, but we have a problem here in the world crisis monitor. I can't remember the problem. What's the problem again? (laughs) There's a shortage of, I should have remembered that one. (laughs) That's real for some of us. Shortage of diapers in the world crisis monitor. Whatever are we going to do to solve the problem? I hope my superhero friends arrive very quickly so we can all work together to Ding find dong. us. Oh, good. Thank goodness you're here, Captain Obvious. <laughs> we have a diaper shortage. Uh, we are in church today. Yeah, and we have a diaper shortage. If you look in the monitor right here. Ryan makes me sleepy in <sighs> church. Yeah. Your underwear is way too tight. I don't know. I have often said the same about you, but never to your face. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm late. I was searching for my super expanding ham, ham pants today. Yes, well, thank I could. You have a magnificent muffin top. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank goodness you're here, excited game show contestant man. Yes, yes. The ga- oh. Oh, look how freely he can run. That is one excited game He's show giving high, nobody's high-fiving him. So there's an excitement level, but an awkwardness at the same time. We and yet there's secu- still a shortage of diapers. We need better security at Curtis Lake Church. We do need better security, and I, okay. Woo! Any, Woo, my whole life I've waited for this. Game show, man, how will we solve the diaper problem? You are sweaty and smelly. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. Excuse me. So about the diapers. Yeah. Yeah. And (laughs) get out of here. Give him a great big hand. Listen, your life is just like that. I don't know if you know that or not, but it is. Your life is filled with surprises, little pieces of paper that you read and you don't know what's going to happen. Sometimes they hurt, 
Sometimes they bring joy. Sometimes you don't know what to do with them. But there is so much improvisation that takes place in your life. And we oftentimes follow our heart that is not controlled by the Holy Spirit. And it leads us into terrible places. But what Romans 8.28 says is that God can take everything. All the situations, all the little pieces of paper, and he can use them for your good. He can turn it into something beautiful. He can make the scenes of your life part of a greater story. So how do we do that? How do we make God our improv partner? Well, first of all, you have to step into the scene. You've got to step into the scene. There's no way around it. You have to make a decision that I'm going to move from standing on the sidelines and I'm going to get on the stage with the Holy Spirit. You have to step into the scene. The crowd asked Peter after the resurrection and after the Holy Spirit had been given and they gathered and Peter preached this amazing message. And they said, Peter, what must we do to be saved? What must we do to have this relationship with God that you're talking about to avoid disaster? And they said, repent. Peter said, repent, believe, be baptized, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's how we step onto the scene. We pause and we say, God, I've got to own my mistakes. I'm a sinner. I can't undo what I've done, but you, God, can forgive me through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we repent, and we begin to live differently, and we allow the Holy Spirit to enter into our lives, and we don't follow our hearts, but we follow His heart. We follow the Holy Spirit. And once we do that, we begin to walk with Him, and this is called life in the Spirit. It's what Romans 8 is talking about. This life in the Spirit where we're not following the sinful nature, our heart anymore, but we're following the Spirit person. We're following God's Spirit that lives inside of us. And we have to learn to live by the rules of improv. And that's what this series is about. For the next four weeks, we're going to look at the rules of improv and how they apply to our lives. We're going to look at stories of people in the Bible who encountered the resurrected Jesus And they learned what it meant to have this improv partner who could take their mistakes and take their shortcomings and take their pain and use it for their good. And so we're going to learn some lessons and some rules that we live by just as improv actors learn rules. So next week, we're going to look at rule number one, which says to focus on the here and now. The following week, we're going to look at rule number two, which says to listen. We have to listen. To be a good improv partner, you have to learn to listen. Rule number three of improv is change, change, change. You always have to change. You cannot be stagnant doing the same thing over and over again. And then rule number four, where we finish up, is an amazing rule of improv that applies to our life in the spirit. Trust your fellow actors. Now, when we started, I made a promise. I said I was going to tell you what only God can do for you. Listen, in our world, you can find relationships anywhere. You can join the Elks Club. I have no idea what that is, but you can join it. You can join all kinds of societies and clubs, and you can build relationships. You can feel love in certain places. You can find somebody who loves you deeply because there is something called common grace. And you can exist your whole life with the love of someone deeply and passionately loving you. You can read self-help books that will help you figure out how to manage your money better, how to manage your marriage better, how to parent better, and you will find success in those areas. I would be foolish to tell you that there wasn't truth that has been given to us. That's a common grace. But what only God can do for you and what only God can do for me is something called redemption. See, I'm not in the business of selling relationships. I'm not in the business of selling businesses. I'm not in the business of trying to make you believe that God can give you a get-out-of-hell-free card or that without God you can't possibly be happy in life. But I can tell you this, nothing can redeem you but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can provide you eternal value except Jesus. And for God so loved the world that he gave his only son to die on a cross that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. And God wants to redeem every poor decision we make. God wants to redeem every good thing we've ever done and use it for his glory. God is in the redemption business of providing value where there feels like there is no value, of taking your life and putting it in the kingdom and doing something significant that can last forever. That's the beauty of the empty tomb. That's the beauty of the resurrection is that we can now find redemption. And I hope you have that. This morning, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for us that, first of all, if you've never crossed that line of faith, if you've never repented, 
and believed that only through Christ you can find forgiveness. If you've never allowed the Holy Spirit to begin to work in your life, never started that journey, I want to give you the opportunity to start that journey today, to just make a commitment to do that. Maybe you're in here today and you say, you know what, Ryan, I made that commitment, but I started following my heart instead of God's heart. And somewhere along the way, I drifted. And I know God loves me, and I know I love God, but I haven't been living that life in the Spirit. But today, I want to re-enter the scene. See, I entered into the scene a while ago. I was a kid, or I was an adult, and I was going through a difficult circumstance, but then my circumstances got better, and I kind of forgot about God and how He wanted to be a part of my life. But I want to re-enter the scene today. I want to encourage you, as I pray, to pray that prayer. To ask God, come into my life. Help me follow you. To pray, God, I want to re-enter the scene. And for those of you who are here and you're following Christ and you feel like I'm right where he wants me to be, my prayer for you is that this series, you will grow closer to him and you will understand what it means to live life in the Spirit. Understand some tactics and some ways to live so that you can trust that God is able to do what he says he can do in your life. I don't want anybody to leave here today without any sense of certainty that they are in God's hands, that they have found that redemption. It is a free gift. It is nothing, there is nothing you can do for it. All the work has been done. We simply receive it. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this moment where we pause and reflect and celebrate the resurrection of your son, Jesus. Well, right now, I pray for those who are in this place who've never stepped into the scene. I pray, God, that right now in their hearts, they would begin to just turn to you, that they would acknowledge that they're a sinner, that they would acknowledge the mistakes that they've made, and they would just begin this journey believing that it's only through the death and resurrection of Jesus that they can have life. And God, I pray for those who made that commitment, but walked away, and life got in the way, and kids and, and responsibilities, and, it, and you became a secondary item. I pray, God, that today a decision will be made to put you first. And God, for those in the room who going to church is a normal routine, and, and a relationship with you is, is a normal part of life, that they're striving to walk close with you, I pray that this series would open up their hearts to what it really means to have life in the Spirit to what it really means to understand that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to your purposes for them. We thank you that you are alive, Jesus. We thank you that you paid the ultimate price, that you took our sin and our death and you bore it and you destroyed it so that we could have life forever with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.